Okay, um, so good morning. Uh, I think we will get started. It's right on the hour at nine o'clock. Um, my name is Jennifer Singer. I'm a urologist and pediatric urology at UCLA. Um, and I will be giving this morning's lecture on pediatric voiding dysfunction. Um, I'd like to introduce one of our residents, Al Santa Maria, who is um, on the side panel of your screens as well. And Al is one of our PGY3 residents who's on the pediatric urology rotation to, right now. And Al will be moderating for us. So he'll be catching your questions and answers and any chats that you have. And we will stop throughout the talk to, um, to address any of those as they come along. Um, I see some more people are, are filing in, but I do think in the interest of time, we'll just go ahead and jump right in and get started. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about pediatric voiding dysfunction. I thought a lot about what topic to talk about for this lecture series. And I felt like a, a lot of other pediatric urologists were talking about some really interesting sort of sexy stuff that we do in pediatric urology, um, the operative stuff. But I really wanted to focus on something that we do a lot of um, and that we see a lot of and that may not be all that much fun for everybody. I think voiding dysfunction is sort of similar to um, pelvic pain for adult urologists in, in many ways, and many pediatric urologists find this to be um, a less um, uh, enjoyable part of their practice, but it certainly is a very important part of our practice, and so I wanted to talk about how uh, at least I think about pediatric voiding dysfunction. Um, oh, why is this? Okay, uh, so for the lecture today, we're going to just a brief over, overview. We'll talk about the epidemiology, just a little bit of voiding dysfunction. Um, I will do a brief review of normal voiding, and this is not going to be very detailed. Obviously, we could do a whole, a whole uh, lecture series on just voiding, but we'll talk briefly about normal voiding. Um, I want to define voiding dysfunction, and then we're going to take this home by doing some present case presentations. And I think sort of anchoring these to this topic in case presentations will make it seem more real and understandable. Um, okay. So voiding dysfunction. So voiding dysfunction is seen up to about a third of the children that we see for lower urinary tract symptoms and maybe up to more than 20% probably in my own practice of the visits that I see in my, in my, in my practice. Um, it is the most common non-surgical urologic diagnosis that we see in pediatric urology. Um, dysfunctional voiding is a broadly encompassing term. Sorry, I have to close you guys for covering my screen. Uh, it's a broadly encompassing term and it's often used inaccurately. And I wanna talk about why that's important. Um, but there is good news about dysfunctional voiding and voiding dysfunction. It's that um, important to understand that we can actually help most children conquer their voiding dysfunction. And this is a really satisfying part of my practice because these families that come in, come into a urologist because they're frustrated and they're, they're having a hard time managing this and it's causing a lot of internal um, potentially conflict with the child and oftentimes troubles at school. And so we can fix these problems and help these children. And so there is a, a light at the end of this tunnel of voiding dysfunction. Um, so I just wanted to sort of highlight what I uh, see in my practice and what a typical sort of pediatric urology practice might look like for a given day. This is, you know, about a, 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 half, a half volume of a, of a given day of my clinic, but we see things anywhere from sort of dysfunctional avoiding, which is what we're talking about today, urethral valves, um, lots of penis problems, circumcisions, torsions, undescended testicles, um, hydronephrosis, and I, in this day I saw urachis. But I want to highlight when I finished my clinic that day, I saw about six patients who ended up having a diagnosis of some sort of voiding dysfunction. So of this clinic schedule, a very good number of the kids that we see are, are skeletal. Um, so just to review of normal voiding, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's just important to understand when we talk about pediatric dysfunctional voiding. Um, normal voiding starts with storage, of course. So the bladder relaxation is under the control of T12 to L2. And uh, urethral sphincter contraction is under control of S2 to S4. Uh, these are involuntary and automatic. Uh, when the bladder reaches full volumes, messages are transmitted through the spinal cord to the pontine micturition center. And then we move on to emptying, where the internal and external sphincters relax, and that's followed by bla bladder contraction. Um, and so normal voiding is controlled by three areas of the central nervous system. Uh, the cerebral cortex provides the highest level of control and is, is responsible for our social and voluntary control avoiding. The pontine nutrition center is located in the brainstem, and this is really where bladder fullness is detected. And this is important. This is where there's a coordination between the synergy of bladder detrusor function and sphincteric relaxation. This is where we see, see the synergy between the detrusor and the sphincter uh, controlled. And then the sacral micturition center is responsible uh, for reflexive voiding. So this is what we see for infantile voiding. 
Um, so just as far as young children are concerned, like I had just mentioned, voiding is purely reflexive in the very young infants and it occur occurs when the bladder is sufficiently distended, sending a reflexive message back to the spine and back to the bladder. Um, by about 18 to 24 months, voiding comes under some sort of cortical control. So this is where parents start to try to toilet train. Um, and it really isn't until about 18 months that there is uh, enough of the cortical control that children can effectively be able to control this. So we all know that in other countries, uh, especially in European countries, attempts to tr uh, treat toilet training happen very early, um, and sometimes as early as 12 12 months. And so it's always very surprising to me that that is effective because the cortical control doesn't happen until about 18 months. And then after about three years of age, there's complete control, which is achieved by the cerebral cortex. Um, so this slide is really intended to highlight how complex abnormal voiding is. And so there's a series of neural uh, reflexes and neurotransmission of the um, signals that happen between the bladder and the the, the brain uh, and the spine, and also a series of release of various neurotransmitter, neurotransmitters is critical for proper uh, relaxation of the sphincter and control of bladder contraction. Uh, and so you can see sort of throughout this, you know, again, the cerebral cortex, this is where we have um, social control, voluntary control. The pontine maturation center is the switch between filling and storage, really helps to control synergic voiding. And the spinal cord is really where we have messages sent back and forth with the sacral uh, reflexive uh, voiding being what happens in infants. These are uh, just a, this is just a cartoon of the normal, normal neurotransmitter transmission uh, with acetylcholine and um, uh, alpha blockade being important for our talk today. Um, and so we'll move on and talk a little bit about what happens if there are any problems or anything goes wrong in these pathways. Um, so, you know, if, if anything happens along any of these pathways, we end up having what's called neurogenic voiding dysfunction. Um, and so we're going to spend some time today distinguishing neurogenic from non-neurogenic voiding dysfunction. Um, but anything that happens between the cerebral cortex, the pontine micturition center, along the thoracolumbar lumbar spine, and to the sacral micturition center, any sort of pathologic uh, occurrence can result in neurogenic voiding dysfunction. So um, if you have a problem with the pontine micturition center, you may have, end up having neurogenic dys, uh, dystonergia. Um, loss of centralized micturition spinal reflux happens along the thoracolumbar lumbar spine. Uh, here, these patients tend to have uh, problems with bladder overactiv overactivity uh, and uh, hypercontractile bladders. And then the sacral, sacral micturition center, if there's a lesion in this area, we tend to have areflexia and oftentimes um, poor emptying and overflow. So for purposes of talking about just sort of general pediatric voiding dysfunction, I want to have some terms that we define so it makes sense as we go through this. So um, what's the difference between voiding dysfunction and dysfunctional elimination? And classically, voiding dysfunction is a loosely defined term uh, that refers to any abnormality in holding and emptying of the urinary bladder. Uh, while dysfunctional elimination is that, urinary voiding dysfunction plus bowel dysfunction. So dysfunctional elimination is bowel and bladder. Uh, but there is a, a distinction between dysfunctional voiding and voiding dysfunction. And I think this is really, really important and where we end up using terminology very loosely in pediatric urology and we say, you know, this child has dysfunctional voiding. That is usually not true. They may have voiding dysfunction, but they don't necessarily have dysfunctional voiding. And this is really important for understanding how we're going to treat these children. Uh, so the formal definition of dysfunctional voiding, um, which is not voiding dysfunction. We talked about voiding dysfunction being sort of a loose, broadly overarching term of any abnormality in the way children void. But dysfunctional voiding occurs when there's poor coordination between the bladder and the urethra, um, specifically where there's this synergy between bladder contraction and sphincter relaxation. So again, as we know, the sphincter relaxes before the bladder contracts. That is a synergic response. So if the sphincter relaxes prior to bladder contraction, then we have synergic voiding. But if the bladder contracts and the sphincter does not relax, this is called dysfunctional voiding, or if it's neurologic, it's detrusor sphincter dysynergic from a neurologic problem. Um, and so this is important. Um, so dysfunctional voiding may present with intermittency of urinary streams. We, we hear kids talk about stopping and starting or stuttering streams. Um, it may be volitional, so children can teach themselves to develop this pattern of abnormal dysfunctional voiding. This was with intentional sphincter closure or, or intentional holding. 
Um, and again, dyssynergy can be neurogenic or non-neurogenic. So it's, it can be neurogenic, as we talked about before, um, if there's a dyssynergy between the relaxation of the sphincter uh, and contraction of the bladder, and this can happen from a spinal cord problem um, that could be a pathology or a lesion of the spinal cord. Uh, Voiding dysfunction or dysfunctional voiding from a non-neurogenic uh, cause is usually related to some volitionally uh, initiated process. So it's important to distinguish those as we go forward. Uh, so when we see these kids, we wanna understand what pattern they're presenting with. So children with voiding dysfunction, usually what we hear as urologists, and if we're listening well, which we'll talk about soon, we wanna really hear what these patterns are, but oftentimes we just hear that these kids are having problems with accidents. And so that's pretty typical what people say, you know, this category of avoiding dysfunction is um, accidents at school. But there are various categories that children can fall into that help us to understand how to treat them properly. So the small bladder versus the large bladder. The frequent voider are those who have frequent urges and warnings to void. Those, they're, they're oftentimes having accidents. These are children that classically have overactive bladder dysfunction. The infrequent voiders, these are the ones who are holders. They have distended bladders. We often call those myopathic floppy bladders. They often say that they're no, they don't feel a warning that they need to go to the bathroom until they have an accident. So they've held for so long, they've lost those, those warnings or those urges. These are underactive bladders. And then the dyssynergic voiders, that's a whole other category that we just talked about. These are the ones who, if you really get down to how are you voiding, they may describe a stuttering stream. Any category of these children can present with urinary tract infection. So that's not all that helpful in distinguishing, but we'll go through how we can distinguish these children. Uh, so it's important, and really my most important take home message today is understanding the, the difference between benign voiding dysfunction and pathologic voiding dysfunction. Because the vast majority of cases that we see in pediatric urology are benign voiding dysfunction. Uh, these, are, these tend to be self-limiting. They are distressing to parents and children. So this cartoon, she is upset about it. They don't enjoy having these accidents, or having these problems at school, uh, but they can be self-limiting. They're usually episodic. Um, oftentimes they're related to stressful events like new schools or new siblings. Um, they can, again, they can be episodic, occurring various times throughout childhood. They may or may not be associated with stool withholding constipation. They may or may not be associated with simple episodes of cystitis. But these benign voiding dysfunction cases do not have um, urologic abnormalities like hydronephrosis, secondary reflux, and bladder trabeculation. So these are bothersome, but not dangerous. The pathologic voiding dysfunction, however, is a different category that is really important to understand. And the reason that I think understanding how to treat voiding dysfunction is so critical is that we see these children. We see children who have pathologic voiding dysfunction, who go on to have renal issues, bladder dysfunction, and really serious pathology that if we don't pay attention early and we don't re uh, reverse it early, they can go on to have irreversible changes. Uh, so these tend to be persistent, chronic, and unremitted, and they oftentimes are not self-limiting and without intervention will progress. Uh, they may lead to bladder and renal dysfunction, so Hinman syndrome, which is the non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder dysfunction syndrome. Those um, can act just like a pathologic neurogenic bladder can act, and they can go on to progress to irreversible bladder dysfunction and renal dysfunction if not appropriately managed and treated. Um, these children often have stool issues as well, chronic constipation, stool impaction, often have encopresis. Um, and we often will see something abnormal in the urinary tract, whether it's hydronephrosis, abnormal urethromentary, abnormal bladder contour, trabeculation, secondary reflux, or um, abnormal urodynamics. Uh, so I'm going to stop for a second and see, Al, if you've received any questions so far. None so far. Okay, thank you. All right, so how do we evaluate children who fall into our, our clinics and they just basically are describing abnormal voiding. Um, so it's very, the most important uh, part of the evaluation is taking a full comprehensive medical history and expanded voiding history. Um, that is really how you can decipher which type of child you're, you're, you're encountering and how you're gonna treat them. Um, of course, a physical exam is, is imperative, um, the normal GU exam, but looking at their spine and also checking for coordination can tell us about subtle spinal cord abnormalities. Um, labs, if they're indicated, so I'll always get a urinalysis, we'll talk about that. Sometimes culture is indicated, um, and sometimes fasting blood glucose is indicated if we think that these children are high volume voiders or if they have um, 
you know, high thirst and high volume voiding. So um, every once in a while, I'll send a kid who I think might have the potential for having, um, sorry about this, um, who may end up having um, fetal diabetes. Um, and then imaging, we're gonna talk about the imaging that we do. So again, the most important, the second most important take home message here is to listen well to these children. And I think what's really difficult is when kids come in with voiding dysfunction, it is hard to listen to this sometimes. It becomes, at the end of the day, your fifth patient who's telling you that they're having accidents at school can be challenging. But without listening properly and getting a full voiding history, you may not treat them properly. Um, so, you know, this is, again, this is kind of what we hear. We hear Linus and Sally hearing their teachers, you know, wah, wah, wah. Hard to listen sometimes to these over and over again, but you have to remind yourself that if you're not listening well to this voiding history, you're gonna miss what's important in making the diagnosis. So, classically, we go through toilet training. When did they, when did they start? Was it an easy or difficult process? Um, what are the characteristics of their complaints? So, mostly we hear that they're having either urinary frequency, accidents, or infections. These are very, very typical complaints but you have to get deeper into that history. Are they having urgency and frequency? Are they holding for long intervals? So do they notice at school that they're going every 10 minutes? Are they holding all day and they don't go until they come home? Um, these are sometimes things parents don't actually even know when, I, when they come into the clinic with their children. And they're surprised sometimes to hear what their children tell them if you really ask them very specific questions. Um, are they dribbling? Do they have leakage or do they have full accidents? Do they have strong, weak, or intermittent stuttering strains? Um, does this occur just during the day or also at night? So usually things that happen just during the day, they're usually behavioral. Um, if children have diurnal issues or nighttime issues, they either have nighttime enuresis because they're young and haven't developed uh, continence at night, or uh, they may have issues with bladder dysfunction, inability to hold at night if there's a more significant so if it's solely during the day, it's usually less concerning that there's an underlying anatomic or congenital problem. If it's diurnal or progressive nighttime, and again, nighttime aneurysis is a whole different category and usually in and of itself is not, it's not terribly concerning, but you do have to figure out how that is associated with their, with their other symptoms. Uh, is there a history of constipation or encopresis? Is there any other medical history that's important? So if these kids are developmentally delayed, do they trip and stumble a lot? Do they have poor lower extremity coordination? We want to talk about their spinal cord. Um, and what was the age at presentation? So this is really important. So if a child presents at, at age six or seven, you want to think about, is this a new problem? Is this related to the tethered cord problem? So um, for those of you who don't know, and for those who do, we'll just remind you that the cord grows over time. And children go through a growth spurt in the spinal cord where around age six or seven, it can grow uh, quickly and tether to the vertebral body. So if it tethers to the vertebral body, that can cause difficulty in having normal uh, neural uh, pathway to the bladder and back. And so tethered cord is an issue that we have to consider for all children who present with sort of later um, presentations of voiding dysfunction. Also ask about coordination. Um, so a little bit more detail, the physical exam, you wanna look for any masses. So I can almost always feel constipation in the, in the left lower colon, um, suprapubic distension or bladder um, retention. Is there tenderness related to infection? Um, when you're doing a GU exam for the female, you always want to examine these kids. So it's pretty typical that people will not examine children with voiding dysfunction because they believe that these are not likely to be related to anything anatomic that they can fix. Um, but you have to do an exam because you may pick up something that's subtle and that you would have missed otherwise. So you want to look at the introitus, make sure that it, the introitus is patent, that there are no labial adhesions. Labial adhesions can cause trapping and vaginal voiding, which can present as, as accidents or leakage. Uh, you want to make sure that there's not uh, chronic erythema or signs of infection. Um, I had a, a very classic case of a child who came in with, came in with typical um, voiding dysfunction symptoms. It was the end of my day. I was pretty tired talking about voiding dysfunction six times that day. And if I hadn't examined this child, I wouldn't have found lichen sclerosis, which is a patchy uh, whitish problem related to um, uh, an immune related issue. And if you don't find things like this, her all of her symptoms were related to lichen sclerosis. We treated her with steroids and she did just fine. So if I hadn't done that exam, we probably would have um, gone down the path of typical voiding dysfunction and treated her with a voiding diary and she would never have gotten better. Uh, for males, you want to make sure, you want to check to see if they're circumcised, do they have phimosis, do they have ballooning, what's the meatal caliber, are they retention from meatal stenosis. Always look at the spine. You always want to make sure that you're not missing a sacral dimple or pitting or tufting of hair. And then a, a brief neuro exam to make sure that you think that there's not an obvious discoordination problem. 
what labs do we get? Well, we should always get a urinalysis. You wanna make sure there's no signs of infection or proteinuria underlying occult renal dysfunction, like the glomerulonephritis can present with prolonged enuresis. So we, also, we always wanna make sure we're checking for that. If indicated, we test a urine culture, and if indicated, a bath. Um, so further evaluation, what do we do with imaging testing? Uh, so we will oftentimes go on and, and choose various imaging tests to further help us make our diagnoses. And the most common tests that I do on kids who are presenting with unclear voiding dysfunction are uroflometry and a KUV. I rarely do a, re a renal ultrasound. It depends on the presentation of the kid unless they're having urinary tract infections. And more rarely do urodynamics or VCUG testing. Usually uroflow and KUV will get me where I need to know. For uroflometry, we're, we're going to talk about that in a second here. Let me talk first about the KUV. Um, so one of the things that we manage a lot in pediatric urology is constipation. Um, the effect of a, an obstructed um, bladder by stool impaction is, is not at all um, uh, rare or subtle. It's incredibly common that we see this in our practices. Children will present, present with voiding dysfunction because its impacted rectum is pushing on the bladder, causing significant bladder dysfunction, may cause retention, may cause recurrent infections. So this is very, very classic, a problem that we will see when we're talking with our, our dysfunctional or voiding dysfunctional children. Uh, as far as uroflometry, EMG is concerned, this is obviously a very simple clinic test. We'll do this on most children who are presenting with abnormal symptoms and we want to get a little bit more information. Uh, so we look for things like typical urine flow characteristics, peak flow, time to initiate voiding, time to completion of voiding. So things that will help us differentiate the category of children is whether or not there's a high peak flow, so that may indicate bladder overactivity, is there a stuttering stream? And we'll see that with one of our upcoming cases in a little bit. So is there intermittency or a stuttering stream that may indicate uh, detrusor sphincter dyspnergia? Um, is there a long, prolonged emptying time? So that may indicate obstruction or constipation. And if you have patch electrodes available for your uroflow in your clinic, you may see whether or not there's normal neural, neural signals that proceed or, or concomitant with voiding. Uh, post void residual, we, we will do this every time we do a uroflow in our clinic. We want to make sure these children are not retaining. Retaining can be a sign of constipation or urethral obstruction. Um, and so, as you know, post void residual measures the amount of urine left after voiding. Um, so, children generally empty their bladders completely. So, they may be they're different than adults where we sort of accept some value of retained urine for adults. The children should empty their bladders completely. Uh, and what this means is anything less than 10% of their bladder capacity. So um, you have a child who comes in, you'll do age-based or weight-based bladder capacity. And when you do a PVR, if they retain less than 10% of their bladder capacity, you are comfortable, likely, that they are emptying their bladders properly. Um, greater than 10% residual su suggests either inpatient voiding. So this is very, very common. And this is something that we always have to figure out when we're doing our full uh, voiding history and listening to our patients. Are they impatient? Do they want to stop short of full, complete emptying? Do they want to go back and play? Do they want to go to the playground? Do they want to avoid their lunch break? Um, or do they want to uh, go back to their video game? So we see this all the time where they stop short. And when you stop short, you um, intentionally may clench your sphincter, intentionally resulting in this DSD pattern that we're talking about. And so this is how children have volitional DSD. When we talk about how you develop Hinman syndrome, it oftentimes will start with inpatient voiding in early infancy. Um, these children can go on to have weak bladder from a history of prolonged holding, urinary tract obstruction, and or constipation. Okay, so what children uh, do we go on to do a more formal evaluation? So, there are not very many children who come to my clinic with voiding dysfunction that will go on to have formal urodynamics of VCUG or video urodynamics. But I do wanna talk about why it's very important to have this in your arsenal of things that you can offer to help you understand which children are having which pattern of voiding dysfunction. And we will see some cases where I did do these testing so that we can uh, highlight how you look at these and use these to help you make the diagnosis. So we know that these are a formal assessment of bladder function capacity, manometric evaluation of compliance, voiding pattern, sphincter function, and pelvic floor innervation. And if, if you add video or fluoro, you will get a visual evaluation of voiding, the shape of the bladder, and you can assess for reflux. <clears throat> so I continue to harp on how important it is to distinguish benign from pathologic voiding dysfunction. And this is really um, sort of illustrative of why that's important. 
So if you see here in this left cartoon panel, this is a normal smooth bladder. This is the bladder that's perbeculated, obviously. But these are bladders that we do see in children who have men with voiding dysfunction. This is a more minor case of that, but these are not things that we don't see. We see these with kids who just have simple voiding dysfunction. Um, this is a typical fluoroscopic evaluation of a fairly normal, maybe small looking bladder. This is the appearance. And this can be from a non-neurologic, non-neurogenic cause. Um, you may end up getting reflux related to your voiding dysfunction. Um, with diverticulation and trabeculation and maybe even secondary hydronephrosis. Um, so what are the various treatment options that we have in our arsenal for treating kids with avoiding dysfunction? Well, um, it depends on their presentation and the category that you find them in. So the, the most important thing about making this diagnosis is figuring out what category your child is in so you know that, how to treat these children. So the treatment courses are individualized. And they include anything from just avoiding diary, which is pretty typical and something that we institute for most kids, uh, with uh, an alarm watch. So oftentimes I'll send kids to school with an alarm watch that triggers when it's time for them to go to school. They all need school notes. So as you probably know or have heard, or maybe none of you have heard this yet, many, many schools require people to use tokens to go to the bathroom. So kids are holding long pests when they want to because they have to use up their tokens to, to go to the bathroom. So they need school notes to allow them to use the restroom. I always tell these children that your recess and lunch breaks are built in as times for you to do these things you have to do. There are times for you to use the restroom, there are times for you to eat and uh, take care of your, your body. Um, but if in addition to those times, you need additional times to go to the bathroom, then we provide these school notes. So how do you treat constipation in children? The most important is hydration. All kids are dehydrated. They're, they're busy. They're active. They're outside all the time. They tend to be dehydrated. It's the, most, it's the number one cause of constipation. Adding dietary fiber. So half the kids in my practice have poor um, diets or, you know, are only eating pizza and cheese. And so we have to talk about, to them about uh, changing their dietary habits, inc inc increasing their dietary fiber. Um, kids love fiber gummies. They're easy to take and they're, they're high in fiber. Uh, this is the most easy way to sort of handle a dietary supplementation. Um, but oftentimes that's not enough and we'll go on to use Miralax, mineral oil, and I'll often do a full cleanses, mag citrate of the lightly full cleanses for kids who are obstipated. Um, if children are in categories that require it, we'll talk about medication options, including anticholinergic therapies, um, and sometimes we have to add intermittent catheterization if anticholinergic therapy is likely to put them in retention. We use alpha blockers like Cardura to help with sphincter relaxation and also to address the dyssynergic sphincter. Uh, very important to promptly treat UTIs. So of course we talk about not treating asymptomatic bacteriuria, but these children oftentimes will develop symptomatic UTIs. And the, the chronic cycle of symptomatic UTIs uh, it will in, uh, increase the, the likelihood that their voiding dysfunction will be difficult to break and treat. So we do treat their UTIs promptly. Um, some children are not managed effectively with these management strategies, so they need to go on and we treat them with biofeedback. The problem with biofeedback, which is basically where we try to train children to recognize bladder sen sensation and learn to control the or the sphincter to relax, they're not always covered by health insurances, they're not widely available, and the quality of the therapist varies significantly. So if you have therapists in your own pediatric hospital, you're much more effective at working directly with them to uh, impart the right um, treatment protocol. But oftentimes, I'll send a child who has a truth or sphincter dyssynergia where I want them to learn bladder relaxation, and they come back and tell me that they were taught to do kegels, which is the opposite of what we wanted them to learn. They're now doing more um, sphincter tightening rather than relaxation. So biofeedback can be just so-so, and it's important to know who you're sending your children to for this treatment option. Um, so again, medications. So we're not going to get too much into the details of this, but we'll use uh, anticholinergics not infrequently. Um, and oftentimes we'll use alpha blockers for sphincter relaxation. Um, so I'm going to stop for a minute to answer any questions before we go on to the cases, which I think are actually the most illustrative in trying to help us understand why this is important and how we can figure out what's going on with these children. So Al, any questions yet? Yes. Uh, would you be able to, again, clarify the difference between voiding dysfunction and dysfunctional voiding? Sure. So let me go back to this slide. Uh, let's see if I can get you guys smaller here. Okay, so voiding dysfunction, again, is sort of just a loose term. So voiding dysfunction essentially is a term that we use to characterize any abnormality in holding and emptying of the bladder. So anything, if you're a holder, if you're an overactive bladder, if you have dysphagia, 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 dysph
But when we're talking about dysfunctional avoiding, and the terms are really confusing because the two words are the same two words, just just, uh, just reversed. Avoiding dysfunction is not the same as dysfunctional avoiding. Dysfunctional avoiding is a pattern of discoordination between the bladder and the sphincter. So normally the sphincter relaxes before the bladder contracts to empty. And if your sphincter stays contracted or has worsening contraction during bladder contraction, that is called dyssynergy. That's where your bladder is trying to empty against a closed door. That's dangerous to your bladder, to, to um, potentially trabeculation of your bladder and to kidney pressures. So that's dysfunctional avoiding, where there's a dyssynergy between the bladder contraction and the urethral sphincter relaxation. Avoiding dysfunction is more, is more broad. Dysfunctional avoiding really means that there's a dyssynergy, again, a dyssynergic avoiding between bladder contraction and sphincter relaxation. Okay, I'll have a second question. Is that it? Uh, I think you're on mute, Al. Y yes, that's it for right now. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's go on and talk about some cases that I think are gonna help to um, clarify some of this. I wanted to first give you just the four presentations to show how simple it is to lose track of listening to these histories and why they may often sound the same, but you'll see how they are very, very different problems. So the first patient, patient one, she has accidents throughout the day and she can't, she says she can't tell when she has to go. So this, this mother brought this child in, accidents throughout the day, says she can't tell when she has to go. Second child, she has to avoid every 15 minutes. We can't even take a car ride without pulling over. So avoiding very frequently, but this child probably can tell because she's telling her mommy need to, to pull over every 15 minutes. Next child, she has to avoid too frequently. She wets during the day and night, the teachers are complaining. So which category is this child in? Is she in the first category, the second category, or neither? And then the, the last patient, patient four, he's having accidents, he's lazy, he poops in his underwear. So this, this parent is frustrated with this child, thinking that he's just lazy and not paying attention. Uh, so what category is this? So obviously we need to get more information. So let's go through these cases. So case number one, she has accidents throughout the day and she can't tell when she has to go. It's a 10-year-old female. She toilet trained normally at age two to three. Um, she has daytime full voiding accidents that have been going on and off for many, many years. She says she can't feel when she has bladder warnings and the urge to void. There have been occasional infections, one or two in her childhood, none with fevers, just simple infections. And there's occasional constipation. They've been on and off Miralax. This is pretty typical. So I hear this a lot. This is a very, very typical pattern. So essentially, you know, I can't really tell when I have to go and I'm having accidents. Um, so when we get more information, and I'm going to show you a lot of imaging today because I want, I want to be able to illustrate the differences in these case, cases, but many of these cases I can treat without having to get a lot of imaging because I am able to work through their histories by listening carefully. But this child um, who has normal toilet training, can't feel when she has to go, having accidents throughout the day. So let's do a flow. So we do a uroflow. So she's 10, so her bladder capacity should be about 300, about double that. So she has a voided volume of 781. So obviously she's got a, hot, a very large bladder. It's a pretty normal um, bell-shaped curve. Um, her PVR, so if you, if you think about a PVR in a child, we say that they should empty to completion, um, but ten, less than 10% of their, of their bladder capacity. So her bladder capacity is 781, but she held less than 78, she's probably doing okay. Um, so she has a large capacity bladder, normal shape curve, normal PVR. Um, if we did an ultrasound, which we did in this kid, she has normal kidneys, no hydronephrosis, very large bladder though. She's got a big bladder, pretty normal KUB, a little bit of stool, very normal patch of stool, normal. So this is a child who has benign voiding dysfunction. She's a urinary holder. She has a large capacity bladder. She really just needs treatment with a voiding schedule, voiding diary, timed voiding, alarm watch, and school note. And this is really all we need to do and get her to comply with this. And usually these kids just do fine. Case two. She has to avoid every 15 minutes. We can't even take a car ride without pulling over. So this is a kid who basically is voiding very frequently. She's age seven. She had normal toilet training, but she started having accidents around age four, both daytime and nighttime, diurnal enuresis around age four. Uh, she avoids frequently every 15 to 30 minutes. It's disruptive at school, home, car rides. Uh, she has, uh, uh, sorry, she has diurnal enuresis. She does have nighttime voiding. There's no UTIs and she has no history of encopresis and no history of known constipation. So imaging for her, kidneys look normal. You know, her bladder may not be full, here's her bladder, but this is um, a very classic appearance of what we'll see with, uh, with sigmoid or rectal fullness. So basically this is stool in her colon. And if you look at her KUB, there's a lot of stool here in her rectum and colon. 
and that is pushing on her bladder, not allowing her bladder to get its normal capacity. So she's going every 15 to 30 minutes because she just doesn't have bladder capacity because she's chronically constipated. Um, so we did do urodynamics on this kid, well, normally would not have, but just for illustrating purposes, um, I'm going to focus on the urodynamic test that we're going to show you this morning. I'm really just looking at their detrusor, so their, um, so their, their compliance curve here, and the urethral sphincter. So I want to focus on these two because we're going to talk about detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, dyssynergy, or an uncoordinated versus coordinated function of the bladder. And we're going to talk about bladder compliance and bladder capacity. So the way we do them at UCLA is we have a minimum acceptable bladder capacity and we have a total mean bladder capacity. So she should be somewhere between 214 and 330. Um, her bladder is just at 213, so just at the minimum accepted bladder size. So it's, it's okay, not great. Um, her detrusor pressures are less than 30 centimeters of water the entire time she's filling. Urethral pressures are what we're gonna look at here. So when she goes to void, her, detrusor, her urethral sphincter should relax and her detrusor pressure should rise, and that's what happens. So her urethra has a tighter pressure until she, she's ready to void. You can see this in your pattern here. So just before voiding, the urethral pressures start to relax, and the sphincter will relax before the bladder contracts. She has normal synergic voiding. Urethra relaxes with initiation of voiding. She empties to completion. She has normal, this is her EMG pattern. She has normal pelvic floor innervation, normal capacity, at normal compliance, just a bit of a small capacity. So really, she also has benign voiding dysfunction. Um, she has urinary frequency. She's in that small capacity bladder category. This child needs management of her constipation. She needs to be able to have stretch intervals. She needs a school note to go to the bathroom, but we, we wanna try to get stretch intervals as possible, increase hydration, manage her constipation. If this fails, and after management of constipation, we may consider a short course of anticholinergics. As we know, the anticholinergics might make her constipation worse, so we always treat constipation first. Um, so also a pretty, pretty benign problem. Uh, case three. So this child has to avoid frequently. She wets during the day and night. The teachers are complaining. So this is an eight-year-old female. Um, she toilet trained normally, but she developed accidents shortly there thereafter. She has diurnal wetting. She does have a history of constipation. She's again voiding frequently throughout uh, the day, every 30 minutes, disruptive again, similar to the last case, sounding very similar to the last case. This child is having some recurrent urinary tract infections. This doesn't sound that different from this last case, case two, or case two. The normal voiding, frequent urination, this one had no UTIs, has no known history of constipation, but we know she's constipated from her imaging. Case three, um, urinary frequency, she does have a history of constipation, but this ch child has had some urinary infections. So a little bit different, but maybe not that different. So when we do uroflometry, what do we see? So this is, you guys might hear my cat, sorry. <laughs> uh, so this is where you might see um, what we call intermittency. This is a stuttering stream. So she's voiding, stopping and starting. This is where she's clenching her, your, her sphincter while her bladder is trying to contract. This is a stuttering stream. This is abnormal. This is uh, suggestive of dyssynergia. She's got a small bladder capacity, but she empties to completion. Um, her kidneys are normal, bladder looks normal, her KUB shows, you know, pretty good amount of, of stool burden throughout the colon, so probably on the constipated side. Urodynamics for this child, so her minimum bladder size should be 230, average should be 360, she's at 119. Um, move you guys out of the way. Uh, if we look at our curves here, we see that this child has an abnormal voiding pattern. So normally we want to see that the urethral sphincter relaxes before the bladder contracts. We do not see that here. What we see is actually the urethral sphincter is busy, is active the whole time she's trying to void. So this is dyssynergy. This is detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. This is basically that dysfunctional voiding pattern. Um, and this child has um, small capacity bladder, normal compliance. She also has leaks and she leaks at a high leak point pressure. She's starting to get worried a little bit. But what would make me wonder about this child as opposed to the last child? Well, this child had intermittency on her Euroflow. So I'm more nervous about this child. And now when I look at her fluoroscopic images, I see an abnormal appearance. So this is called the spinning top deformity. The bladder is trying to empty against a closed door. It blows out the proximal urethra and blows out the base of the bladder. We call these bladder ears. So she's starting to get high pressure voiding. 
all these children should have spinal imaging because this could be from a, a tethered cord or other sort of subtle spinal cord abnormality. She had normal spinal cord Im imaging. So this is a uh, non-neurogenic, neurogenic bladder dysfunction. Um, this is the spinning top deformity we talked about. This is why we call it spinning top deformity because it looks like a fairly classic spinning top. Um, so this is pathologic voiding dysfunction. It's non-neurogenic, but it's still pathologic. This child needs more aggressive treatment. We manage her constipation, increase hydration, a very strict voiding diary with timed and patient voiding. Um, but we've got to get her to learn to relax her sphincter um, to avoid volitional dyssynergic voiding. So we've got to figure out how to do this and how can we get children to relax their sphincter? Well, one, patient voiding. So they need to be able to sit on the toilet, count to 30 while they're voiding, not be allowed to go back unless they've counted to 30 at the last drip of voiding. So they have to be patient with their voiding. Um, Anticholinergic therapy may be helpful uh, because in her case, you want to increase the bladder capacity, but anticholinergic therapy may end up causing her constipation to be worse, so we have to follow that. Alpha blockade, so here I might use Cardura to relax her sphincter to help her with sphincteric relaxation. If these fail, we may end up having to go on to biofeedback and send her for biofeedback if we can find the right therapist. This is a pathologic voiding dysfunction, and it really didn't sound that different when the patient came in for presentation. Um, we have two more cases, and then we will, we will be complete. Uh, so case number four, this is a 28-year-old male who presented to my clinic with chronic kidney disease. So this is different. He didn't present with voiding dysfunction, but he was referred to urology for severe bilateral hydronephrosis. When I talked to him, I asked about his voiding history, and he said, well, yeah, you know, Dr. Singer, I void with a weak stream. I sort of dribble." Never really thought much of it. His whole life, he sort of just dribbled. When we did his imaging, there was a CT scan done during his transplant evaluation, but when we did his imaging, thin parenchyma, severe hydrourethronephrosis, really serious at bladder um, thickening. Uh, this is either the ureter or more likely a diverticulum, um, very thin wall bladder over here, and then the ureters are dilated. And so if you look at the fluoroscopic image, very, very significantly trapangulated bladder with a uh, a Christmas tree type appearance and significant diverticulation. So this is a patient who his whole life just thought dribbling was normal, um, but this is what ended up happening. He went into renal failure. So this is his urodynamic test. So basically his minimum bladder size should be 374, it's 187. It's a small capacity bladder. His compliance is very poor. He reaches high pressures, uh, high bladder pressures, well over 30 centimeters of water throughout voiding after he reaches very small volume. Um, he leaks with high pressures, he's dribbling throughout the urodynamic test, and his urethra stays um, busy the entire time. So he has no urethral change. So basically the urethra is constant. Um, it does not relax. It's constantly clenched throughout the entire urodynamic test. So this patient has um, a much more serious case of, of a Hinman syndrome, non-neurogenic, neurogenic voiding dysfunction. We did an MRI on his spine, it was normal, um, but he has severely trabeculated bladder, the capacity is really small and he has blown out his bladder and now his kidneys are uh, in failure. And I wanted to highlight the difference between these two cases. So case eight was an eight-year-old girl who had DSD and she presented basically with some accidents and urinary frequency and occasional urinary tract infections. And this man who's 28 went from this bladder when he was probably eight to this bladder when he was 28. And really for lack of having attention to managing this early enough to, re to reverse the problem and protect his kidneys. So this patient has pathologic voiding dysfunction, Hinman syndrome, non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder dysfunction. He required bladder augmentation surgery with lifelong CIC and anticholinergic therapy and had it a kidney trauma. Um, this is the last patient we're going to talk about. So this is another patient who, whose parents think that he's just lazy. He's having accidents, is lazy, poops in his underwear. Um, he's six-year-old. He toilet trained at age two, developed diurnal enuresis and stool accidents at, at well at age five. No, no infections. He tells us, I just don't feel when I have to go to the bathroom. He has no urge, no warning. He has no apparent behavioral concerns. He, he doesn't have hyperactivity. He's a good student, but his family is frustrated. They've tried everything. They tried rewards and punishment. Um, we did some imaging. He had a normal kidney ultrasound. He did have a large stool burden on KUB. Um, this is actually a stock image because I didn't have his urodynamic. This is his bladder, elongated and trabeculated. Um, and if you looked at this kid's urodynamics, he would have a small capacity bladder, uh, very importantly, has very significantly dyssynergic voiding. So the urethral sphincter is contracting while he's trying to void. So as he tries to void, the sphincter is constantly contracting. So this is that dyssynergy 
uh, and this is where these kids can get into trouble, um, and his bladder is severely trabeculated. So we went on to, um, to evaluate him with urodynamics, elongated bladder, uh, large PVR, retains more than 100 of each void, a synteric disc synergy. Uh, sorry, this is incorrect, actually. This child had a spinal MRI that showed a fatty infiltration of the phylum terminale and a tethered spinal cord. So this child, whose parents think he's just lazy, he's not, going, he's not paying attention to his bladder warning, they, were, they did not think that he had anything significant going on or were, were trying to treat him with rewards and punishments. This kid has a tethered cord. Uh, so without ident identifying his tethered cord, he would go on to have more significant problems, but he had uh, laminectomy and detethering by neurosurgery and did well ever since then. He's age 18 now. All of his symptoms are resolved and he's reversed all of his voiding symptoms. So in summary, voiding dysfunction, not dysfunctional voiding, voiding dysfunction is common. We must identify the category to ad adequately treat. We must differentiate benign from neurogenic etiologies. And these patients can be successfully managed and treated with careful and thorough evaluation and then adapting an appropriate treatment plan based on their patient presentation. Thank you, and I will take any remaining questions. So, Al, are there any other questions that have yes. come through? Yes, if you could go back to case number three. Um, and the question is, what was your trigger for ordering a Eurodynamics? Um, as you can see, uh, there may have been some stuttering flow on the Euroflow and a large stool burden on the KUB. Would you have tried biofeedback and treatment for the constipation before uh, the Eurodynamics? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So generally, we do try to do everything that we can um, less invasively before we, we bring these kids to Eurodynamics. Um, because the Eurodynamics, for this child, sorry, uh, the urodynamics for this child um, got us onto biofeedback anyway. So the problem that I have with sending kids for biofeedback without having urodynamics is that you don't actually know how to tell the biofeedback um, therapist how what the what the problem is you're trying to treat. So again, most biofeedback therapists that you send kids to will actually teach them to do kegels, and kegels are basically where you intentionally uh, clench your sphincter to avoid accidents or a weak or weak sphincter. They work better for, for women who have um, stress urinary incontinence. And so oftentimes, unfortunately, these kids get sent to these biofeedback therapists who also treat adult women who have stress urinary incontinence. And the catch-all for them is to do, um, to do kegels and teach them how to, how to clench their sphincter. In this child, that would have done exactly the opposite of what we were trying to intend to do. We wanted her to learn relaxation. So oftentimes, I need to send them with their urodynamic studies to very, very clearly tell the biofeedback therapist what they are trying to treat and how I want them to try to treat them. This works a lot better if you're doing this in centers where you have biofeedback therapists in your own clinics. Not all centers do at UCLA. We don't have this, and so we have to send them to outside therapists and know which ones we can trust and which ones we have to work very closely with. Um, for this child, I was worried about the intermittent stream. She had a small capacity bladder. Um, usually, I'll work with these kids for several visits before I'll actually do urodynamics on them to see if, if we just try with more mental manipulations, with avoiding diaries, with management of constipation, will this reverse some of this? But oftentimes, it doesn't. And if you continue to have your inflammatory shown stuttering stream and you're not making any progress, then that's when we move on to the more... Um, significant evaluation. And again, if I think I'm going to send somebody for biofeedback, I really want to understand how to tell the biofeedback therapist what I need them to treat. Okay, um, Al, any other questions? Thank you. Um, and now we have a two-part question. Uh, how big of an impact do family stressors play on dysfunctional voiding? And, if, and is this something that you assess during your initial workup? Yeah, very good question. So for sure, that's important. So that's part of sort of the listening process. Um, and oftentimes, if I hear that a child was completely normal, where is my, um, my slide with Linus and Sally? <laughs> um, so uh, oftentimes, these cannot know where I have it. But yeah, so oftentimes with these, uh, these children, it is related to something that's new in the family. We'll ask about whether or not they've had a recent move. Oftentimes, if there's a new child in the family, these children will develop some, some degree of voiding dysfunction related to that. So if I can clearly tell that this is related to something that's happening when there's a stressor in their life, then we will really focus on attention to that and have the families work on that before we do more significant evaluation. I, the, the purpose of showing you all the urodynamics that I'm doing and all the testing that I'm doing is to illustrate how important it is to differentiate the cases that we're treating. But it is true, and a very important take-home message today is that we don't jump to the urodynamics on all these patients. We want to address them from a history first. 
So if we can get a lot of information, we can get a lot of information from their histories and focus on those first and make progress and not see any concerning findings on, say, for example, a renal ultrasound or their uroformetry, then we will not move on to do more significant um, evaluation with urodynamic testing like that. But yes, I see that. And I think it's probably similar to sort of the garden variety stomach ache. So kids will present with either urinary or with GI symptoms when there's stress in their life. Some kids will present with, um, with um, diarrhea and just garden variety abdominal pain. Other children will present with urinary frequency and urgency and accidents. And so we definitely want to make sure we're not dealing with kids who are just going through stress in their life. And we see a lot of this focus from that. Now, is there a part two? Yeah, part two of that, which I think you've uh, partially answered, would be the management of um, uh, dealing with family stressors when it's associated with dysfunctional avoiding. Yeah, so that's that's tricky. Um, so, you know, we do find ourselves as urologists oftentimes sort of um, straddling where we can help these families and where we're not the right people to help these families. And oftentimes this is one of those areas. Um, so if we identify that these children are having issues related to stress, I'll talk with their pediatricians and ask them if there's ways for pediatricians to kind of help focus on that and spend more time on that. Um, some of these children go on to require some, some short-term therapy um, for very significant stressors that happen in their life. And so we will definitely work closely with pediatricians um, on trying to address those things. We don't jump to, to um, do interventional management of children who we think are having um, stress-related urinary um, avoiding dysfunction. Now. All right, next question. Um, have you noticed any uh, gender or racial disparities associated with dysfunctional avoiding? Huh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, not in my practice, I don't think so. And I actually can't say that I've read much about gender disparity with, dis with avoiding dysfunction. Um, in my own, I'm thinking about these kids who I'm presenting here. Um, and of these five patients that I presented, two were young white girls. One was an African-American man, one was an, a Hispanic boy, and then the other was uh, a Hispanic teenage girl. So I don't think so. I haven't noticed that in my practice, um, but I think there may be issues related to access to care where some may present later. So um, that is potentially possible. My, the 28-year-old patient who presented with renal failure was an African-American man, um, but uh, maybe maybe more related to access to early care and management, but not probably in the incidence of these disorders. All right, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, do you happen to have an algorithm uh, for the sequence of tests that you order for these patients? Uh, these uh, tend to be commonly asked questions on the SASP. Uh, so there are algorithms that have been written. I don't actually have my own as much as I, um, most of my algorithm is related to my own experience, I have to be honest. Um, and having listened to these kids for 15 years, I, I kind of have my own internal algorithm of where I go. Most of these kids get uroflometry, and I would imagine that's probably almost always the, the first test to be done for an SASB question about avoiding dysfunction. Um, renal ultrasound is unnecessary for most of these children because most of these children won't end up having renal dysfunction unless they present with urinary tract infections or have a history of urinary tract infections. Those kids should have ultrasounds. Um, the constipated kids, a lot of people will manage without KUB just based on constipation history. I actually do a KUB for kids I'm worried about constipation for because um, I have uh, an algorithm that I use for treating constipation that includes full bowel cleansing depending on how obstipated they are. So. Um, I generally am doing a lot of uroflometry and KUB. I'll do an ultrasound if kids have urinary tract infections or abnormal uroflometry that looks stuttering and I'm concerned about the potential for having secondary renal issues. Um, but not my own algorithm. Although I should, I should write one and send it to you all. <laughs> now, next question. Um, and I think that's all, those are all the questions that we have for now. Perfect. Okay, well, let me just take one quick look here. Um, Oh, we have one more question that yeah. just came in. Um, someone asked, um, given that there's an increased number of transgender uh, children, let's see, due to volitional avoiding and access to care to appropriate, uh, appropriate oh, sorry. Um, I got the question. question just, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, you have it. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, so question about um, transgender, transgender children access to bathrooms and dysfunctional avoiding. 
What I will say, so I have not seen yet an issue related to the transgender population in particular, but what I will say is that I have a very, very large number of children, a good percentage of the kids that I see for avoiding dysfunction who actually have issues with access to bathrooms at school. Um, and this is not a small thing, and I actually have written letters to principals and, and uh, school districts before um, because I've heard this more for some kids that are coming from the same school districts than others. But some of the issues are that kids have very short uh, time periods between classes, so they may have like three minutes to get from class A to class B acro across campus and they can't get to a bathroom in time. There are other kids who have no access to a local bathroom to the, to the um, to the classroom that they're in. And this is actually a real issue. And I have seen some kids who actually go on to have very, very significant voiding dysfunction. Some progress with abnormal um, urodynamic testing when they are just not having access at school. And so there's a lot of communication with principals with school districts about this. I do have issues with the token allowances for, for kids, which is a significant, um, um, it, it, it is a disincentive to children to go to the bathroom on time or when they need to. I do have to work with these kids in making sure that they're not avoiding the breaks that they're given to use the bathroom. So there is a whole category of kids who want to go to the playground at recess and want to go to the playground at lunch and avoid those built-in break times. But when I know that they're using them and they're still having issues with access to bathrooms, I do get involved and it is a real issue and it's been a known and written about issue. So um, may, like, may potentially come in the future with more um, transgender children who don't have access to uh, a comfortable bathroom space, but it's definitely a known issue for children in general. Okay, so I think um, Michelle and Kirsty probably have sent you all my email address or um, we will make sure that it's posted with uh, this talk. I really appreciate your attention today and I uh, hope you all stay safe out there in the world right now. Um, please reach out with any further questions and I wish you all a happy, happy day. And Al, thanks for your help today. <laughs>